Uh, what's up, guys, and welcome back to Throwing It Around. I'm diving back into some SEC action now with Miss Daniel Gibson, former Arkansas first baseman and current volunteer coach for the University of Georgia Lady Dogs. Let's let's go and get started, guys. First, thanks so much for sitting down with me, Daniel. I mean, as a softball fan and a Bulldog fan, of course, I mean, you don't know how happy and excited I am to get this uh, to get this up and going. So first, I want yeah, to start of off. So first, I want to start off with you just telling us a little bit about yourself and really how you got into the game of softball. So um, I have been playing softball for probably like around 16 years, just really just enjoying the game. I'm still finding enjoying it is uh, a happy sign and a good sign for me to keep to continue playing. Um, but I've always wanted to be a teacher or some of some sort, whether that's in the, in the classroom or on the field. And I just feel like I have a really good opportunity to continue being a teacher on the field. So. Awesome. So growing up, did you play any other sports besides softball? I mean, then when exactly did you decide to just focus solely on softball? Um, I played volleyball in high school and uh, it's kind of funny. My family is volleyball, uh, basketball, backgrounds and so I always thought that I had a really good shot to play volleyball in college played softball and I've always loved it but kind of fell out of love with it around 13 and 14 and decided that my path was going to be uh, volleyball and then I got hurt needed surgery my sophomore year of high school and softball it was so okay. It's but it's been it's been great. I just love sports in general. And so either I was playing either one, I feel like I would have given my heart to either one. So for sure, for sure. So and you actually started your college career off in Tempe at, uh, at Arizona State. And I actually didn't know that until I started trying to do some research on you. And I, I honestly I was telling my brother a while ago, I thought you were your entire college career was at, at Arkansas because that's where I really started to, to, to notice you at. But uh just kind of tell me how you, uh, how you ended up choosing Arizona State, and then I want you to jump over to Fayetteville and how you ended up there. So I picked Arizona State out of, out of high school. I'm a Southern California native, Pac-12. Uh, I was bred to participate in, and so um, anything Pac-12 was really the goal. And so I had some SEC schools looking at me, um, some Big 12 schools looking at me, but ideally I would have – I loved – to stay close to home. I have family in Phoenix and in Queen Creek and Mesa. So um, it, it just made sense for me to go to Tempe to be around family and for my family to only have a five hour drive to come and see me play. And um, I loved my time in Tempe. I thought that I learned a ton about myself and learned a ton about how to be a teammate and just wanted a little bit more from a program. And so I decided to be one of the first to put my name in the transfer portal. That's when the portal kind of hit and had no idea that Arkansas was going to be my destination, but here we are. Now I'm keep inching further and further away from my family, which they give me a hard time about, but it's, it's all for the betterment of my career and, and what I want to uh, be as a head coach. And so I just feel really grateful that Arkansas gave me an opportunity to come and play at their school and to be able to represent them in a way that uh, I was able to. And my heart is in Fayetteville. I don't know how I ever lived on the West Coast now that I'm in the South, but it's, it's great. And I, I loved it and I loved all my time there. But looking ahead and to be able to get myself one step closer to becoming a head coach in the, in the far future, was to be able to come down here to Athens and learn from a, a, an incredible staff. Of course. And, hey, I mean, when it comes to actually choosing the first place to go to college, I can definitely sympathize with wanting to stay close to home. I know, I mean, Arizona State, I mean, I know in the past couple of years, they've been known to, uh, to have a pretty big and competitive uh, Pac-12 program in the um, – with with softball other uh, other programs you know some schools are just known for certain sports and i know I've, I've always had my own arizona state softball more than anything and before we go any further i i, I don't want to neglect not thanking our sponsors here with the law office of joseph i marchant the riles drugstore the merchants and citizens bank the milton cpa services stamps walker insurance agency the vineyard doodles and the cannon law firm and uh next question i mean 
freshman year, a lot of people dream when they get to the big level of college softball, especially in the Power Five, they want to get to Oklahoma City. They want to go to the Women's College World Series, and you accomplished that freshman year. So just fresh into college here, I mean, to, so how did it make you feel to actually get to Oklahoma City in year one? Well, I came into my freshman year obviously wanting to be in Tempe for the next four years, and I was just excited to be there and excited to learn and to be coached um, at a high level. And so I got in there, just decided to tell myself every single day that I wasn't afraid to fail. And I will always remember a conversation that I had with one of my coaches, uh, Carly Wynn. She came up to me and was like, man, you're just one that isn't afraid to go for it. And that just really has stuck with me because I really feel like that's my personality is I want to be coached. I want to be given all the information to be able to become better, but I'm not just going to store that in my brain. I'm going to act upon it. And so that was something really cool. And obviously you come in as a freshman and you're not necessarily like you want to play and you want to start, but it's not something that's right on your mind. You're around all these girls who have been in this uh, sport multiple years who have uh, accolades upon accolades, all Americans and everything. And so I was, uh, my name was on the lineup sheet on game one of, of, uh, that, that season. And I was just, I was nervous as all be, and, mm -hmm. but I was able to kind of just bring myself to earth again, day two and see my name on the lineup card again and, and go at it and just sort of performing, performing because I wasn't afraid to, mess up, I guess. And so ended up playing that whole year, doing some pretty good things for, for Arizona state and, and our team and being able to clinch the title, to be able to go to the world series that year was something that I'll never forget. And one of my best friends that I was able to gain from this experience, uh, G war, as I just remember giving her the biggest hug after we won and we beat South Carolina and it, you know, it was an experience and, and something that I'll cherish forever. And then walking into Oklahoma city day one of practice and just feeling all the feels and how nerve wracking mm -hmm. it was. And you kind of forget how to play softball there for a second. Cause you're just like, Oh my gosh, this is what I've dreamt of my whole life. And I've watched my favorite players come and play on these stage on the stage. And, you know, it's, it's something that I was able to take to Arkansas and, and incorporate that kind of mindset to get there. So and of, of course, when y'all got to Oklahoma City, I mean, I've heard in interviews before players talk about, hey, it's a, it's, it gets the adrenaline pumping, but also, like you said, you get nervous of, of you, you, for a second that you forget, like you said, how to play softball. So did, did the adrenaline hit you first or did you get very nervous once you, once you stepped out to first base on that first game and uh, out there in OKC? I think I was honestly my nerves were, were just cooking. I we played Oregon our first game and there was um, no shot that we had a shot to be down there. I think the number two seed, one or two seed that year. And I'd faced Miranda Elish three or four times prior into the season and was successful. And so I go in there and I'm just like not thinking that we're just going to roll through them, but you get you get in there and you forget what you prepare for. And it takes an elite competitor to be able to really slow their slow their mind, slow their breath and something that I just didn't have experience in and neither, of, none mm -hmm. of us had experience in it. And that, that's not to give an excuse or anything, mm -hmm. but it is a different, it's a different ball game there. It's, you have to really be uh, in, uh, very intentional with breathing and bringing yourself back to, back to planet earth. So. Oh, absolutely. And I know times that I've watched the women's college world series, I mean, of course, you've been there, but it looks like that you're literally being sat on top of by the crowd there. I mean, it looks like y'all are just packed in there, and I can actually see how those the adrenaline flows, but then there's so much nerves there as well. But when once once you do something that really shows out that hey, I'm I'm meant to be here, that's when it kind of starts to settle down for you, and then the then the adrenaline is comes in comes in to stay. Right, one hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so now flipping the page, we're in Fayetteville now. Uh, you've moved up, you've moved to Arkansas. And I want to talk about like the environments that you play in, in the SEC. I mean, it's, it's, it's a given. I know a lot of people will agree that everybody loves and would want, wants to come play in the SEC, especially people down here in the South have that opinion. Now that you're in Fayetteville, I mean, other than playing at home, I mean, is there a stadium that you've played in uh, 
that's probably been your favorite place to play. I mean, if you want to go back to Pac-12 days, you can. But other like so, basically, staying in the SEC if you want to. Is is there another place that you've been to where like, man, I really want to go back there? Um, honestly, here in Athens, I I wow. loved competing in Athens, and maybe that came with some good results, but. <laughs> I I just thought that Athens was a great place to be and a great environment. I like the way that they the fans are very respectful and they mm-hmm. just love the game. They love the sport. And not necessarily everywhere you get that and you feel that. I think right. that some places they get a little bit um a little mean, I would say, lack right. of better yeah. words. Yeah. So they get a little mean and they start saying some things about you and your family and you're like what the heck I'm just here to play softball I'm Mm -hmm. just here to play and 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 do what I love and so but coming here was was great and so that's always given me a great impression and so which is initially why I was able to make this decision so easily was to transition and uh move over here and of course this may sound this may sound a little biased on my end but truly you can't go wrong with Jack Turner Stadium man right it's beautiful out here oh absolutely (laughs) And uh, you spoke about South Carolina earlier about being able to beat them and go on to uh, advance yourself in the advance yourself in the playoffs. I interviewed South Carolina pitcher Carson Oaks in an earlier video of mine, and I asked her about I mean, what was the toughest opponent that she had ever faced. And this question was actually more suited toward hitters than it is with pitchers because she touched on how each at bat is different for a pitcher. So I mean, is there somebody? Is there a pitcher? during your college days that you uh, thought was the toughest one to face? And I will accept more than one answer. That's a good question. Um, I think that it's hard to pinpoint the toughest because you think, oh, the toughest probably have have struck me out multiple times or the toughest have, um, you know, made me made me come out of myself. But I think about it and I think about competitors and people in the circle who are just not willing to give up the ball. And Vodder from Stanford was someone who I competed against my junior year in regionals. And she just wasn't taking no for an answer. She wasn't taking any freebies for an answer. She made every pitch uh, a pressure pitch. And so I have to give her mad respect for that. And, you know, you find some, some success off of her. We were able to beat her, but you have to just be that much more into the game, hit into each pitch, and it keeps you honest about going through the motions. But I would say her is probably – she's definitely one of them. Um, I think – let's see. Maddie Penta was had three speeds at her best, which was definitely something to keep in mind when you're up to bat. Um, uh, I mean, Dulcini. Dulcini from, from Texas – just wasn't taking no for an answer. And so when you when you go up to bat with someone with a mindset like that in the circle, it's like, okay, right. she's having some, she has her stuff that she throws and she provides, but her mindset behind each pitch that she delivers is hard to beat. And so you have to be able to match that, match that mindset against her of like, she's coming out for blood, she's trying to beat you. And you have to be able to match that same, like, cutthroat mentality oh, that, she, that she that she um displays and so I think that's why she was so successful um you know I think that every pitcher has good days and bad days but I think right. her bad days her bad days were very little because of her mindset and the way that she approached each batter oh absolutely I mean I've, I've told people before it's an absolute chess match in the head really between hitters and pitchers and I mean basically I mean I, I was going to add to the point of what you were saying is that the toughest pitcher that somebody may have faced doesn't mean that you've never recorded a hit off of them. It's just this toughest pitcher may have just made you work the hardest. Right. 100%. 100%. And as a player, I know you've collected many accolades over the past couple of years. Most of them kind of coincided with the emergence of Arkansas becoming the team to beat in the West over the, I know the past two years, I know you've, uh, you were a two-time All-American. You were a finalist for the collegiate player of the year. I'm looking at a uh, Honda sports award. And uh, multiple con- multiple uh, multiple conference and NFCA all region honors, but just kind of talk about the prior two seasons with Arkansas because I was kind of uh, really impressed with the emergence of Arkansas coming up. I know the coach out there is amazing. I know the past couple of years everybody wanted to focus on Alabama as the big 
uh, as the big powerhouse in the uh, out there in the West. I know Patrick Murphy, absolute dominant coach out there. But talk about how Arkansas got up to that top spot. Yeah, it took a lot of um, a lot of you know this basic answer of blood, sweat, and tears, but it was finding uh, an identity of who we were as a program. We didn't have, we necessarily didn't have one coming in my, my, when I transferred my sophomore year was they had a good year before that, but what was Arkansas softball? Nobody knew. You talk about the Oklahoma's, you talk about the, the power offense that like Georgia has, Oklahoma has, you know, that they have great offensive uh, players. Who can put up some runs, but Arkansas, you, you're like, do they have? A, or are they good because their defense? Are they good because they're pitching? Are they good because they're hitting? So they had Mary half that year to be able to deal with them in the circle with Autumn Storms to compliment. But we were finding our identity. We were still trying to compete and show ourselves not as just a one-hit wonder program where we had one year, but being able to maintain that success. And so, our that sophomore year, we had a ton of growth that we had to go through was, okay, how do we continue this level of success? And so you saw us go down a little bit. We are at this high, we go down a little bit. We're just finding out who we were. We're, we're understanding what it looks like to be a good teammate, how to respectfully be coached by our coaches um, and finding ways to get into a spot where we understood that it takes what it takes. It doesn't have to be pretty. And then we had some great additions along the way. Um, that freshman class that I came into, so that, that sophomore class that were my age, were tremendous athletes. They just didn't have the the years that they needed to be able to, or admit, not necessarily the years, but the the time to be able to be showcased. And so it just took time for all of us to be able to mesh together. And I'm grateful that we had the four years that we did because of COVID in there to really get um, in with each other. And it doesn't look like we were best friends or had the greatest relationships. It just looks like we respected the crap out of each other and we loved each other on the fields so much that it showed in our performance. And that's something that I would love to get any of my players to, to really, any of my kids I give lessons to, or even the girls here at Georgia is um, it's not all about success on the field. It's, really about how can you be a high level human and be a high level teammate and connect with your girls on the field. And so you just saw us mesh more. You saw us mesh more my junior year where we were just having each other's backs. And then we added some really great additions my senior year, like Taylor Ellsworth and KB sides. And you get a little bit more talent in there and man, we're connected. We've got more talent. We've got depth in the circle. And it was like, we were unstoppable. We felt that and we competed like that. So Oh, absolutely. I know there were certain stretches of the season where people are wondering if y'all were ever going to go down at all. I mean, and it was just absolutely impressive. In 2021, y'all captured the regular season title and were, they fell short in the uh, fell short in the tournament. You'll get the new girls in there coming in 2022. Y'all take it one step further and uh, unfortunately fall in the Supers to Texas. And I mean, that was just an absolute dominant Texas team that y'all fell to in the Supers. I know they eventually fall to surprise, surprise Oklahoma in the finals. But just, um, just all around, I mean, I was absolutely looking at Alabama. I go back to the stereotype of everybody looked at Alabama, and I saw Arkansas. Y'all came up and just blew everybody away by the way y'all were performing. Yeah, and I think that's how we connect with a lot of our fans is is mm -hmm. at, in Arkansas you play in a, in a stadium where you have 3,000, 4,000 fans there each game. And you just fall in love with the way that we play. It's not that we're good at softball. It's because how we connect with each other, the hype that Hannah Gamble has at third base, the, mm -hmm. the love you see um, after every single home run. And it's just little things like that where the fans really feel like they're connected with the girls. And that's been something that I've always cherished that I'll take into my coaching career is uh, how can we incorporate just loving each other and people loving the way that you play, loving the style that you have. And I'm actually glad you brought that up. That was one other play I was trying to think of that really kind of got y'all on that roll too. Hannah Gamble, I mean, just absolute beast up there, uh, up there in the box as well. I mean, she handled the hot corner well. And, and, you know, that's another thing too. I mean, just pure talent can get you far enough too. 
But, I mean, you think about the environment around the team. I know Arkansas, y'all had that following all year. Fan base never really thinned out by the way it looks. I mean, you can, I mean, y'all traveled well. And just the electricity that was there when y'all played in Fayetteville as well is one thing that kind of like pushed y'all along and like pulled the opposing team back to where y'all would just – y'all would capture those wins and just get better and better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I got to give credit to Coach Dyfel. She was just very into with – like she was just into getting fans to be softball – like softball fans. She was into getting Razorback fans to be softball fans, and so she was always out in the community doing that. But it was like she would walk around the circles and everyone would just be waving at her and she'd be introducing herself and being able to set that example. And then here here you are now where we're having our girls, me included, of like thanking our fans for being there, like waving to them when we're walking into the stadium. And so making them feel connected was huge. And that's that's all that fans really want is they want to feel connected to their teams that they support. And they felt connected to us last year and, you know. So it's it's it was an exciting and, and atmosphere and environment to play in for sure. I know there's been several years in the several years in the past now that Arkansas has kind of been overshadowed. The softball program really has been kind of been overshadowed by the su- success of the baseball program as well. And I, I can see now that I mean y'all are probably already right on the tail of the baseball program, if not probably. And I, I know Pat, I know this past year y'all overshadowed the baseball program for sure. And I mean just for the overall success. So just kind of moving on now, now that you've uh, just a few just a few months ago, you wrapped up your rookie, a rookie, excuse me, rookie season with Athletes Unlimited Softball. You're professional now. Uh, teams are, I, I believe, if I got this, uh, if I understand this right, teams are named after a certain player on the team. Is that because of a, are, are they designated as a captain maybe? Yes. Okay, yes. so for those who may not know, like can you explain the or show the difference between this and some other – leagues like national pro, pro fast pitch with other well-known teams like the U triple SA pride or the Houston scrapyard and dogs. I know they have, I know you'll have a big partnership with ESPN. I know, and it's starting to gain, uh, gain headway now. Yeah. So there's two, there's really three kind of leagues, but two main leagues. We have the, um, WPF and they've got U triple SA. Um, they just added a couple more teams. They have, uh, a couple like a Vipers team. Mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you exactly what they what they have, but they are traditional seven inning games. They go and travel and compete and play against each other. And with Athletes Unlimited, they've incorporated a scoring system that not only allows you to compete individually, but to also involve competing a, as a team. And so you get points for each hit so like a single is like 10 points a double 20 triple 30 home run 40 each out a pitcher has is four is four points and so as you go through these five weeks these points add up but at the end of each week so each week is three games the top four um, point performers will then be announced as captains and so that Sunday they'll be announced captains Monday, they'll go through a draft. And so they'll have all 60 of us in a draft room and available on the sheet. So 50, 56. And these four athletes get to pick their teams now, essentially. And so they're picking based on uh, pitchers, they need top performers, they need hitters. And so everyone has a little bit different of a um, like uh, strategy, strategy but it is a pretty cool system to be able to go in there and not be based basically just on social media platforms or whatnot. It's like who actually performs and who can generate the most points. And sometimes it gets a little tricky because if you're on, if you get lucky and you're on a winning team each, each single time, then you're obviously going to rack up some more points because each inning win is 10 points. So each time you win an inning and then each time you win a game is 50 points. And so all that adds up very quickly. So it gets, it gets a little tricky because you're having to think about how can I perform as an individual? So how can I rack up my own individual performance points? And then how can I also help the team win? And so it's things like sacrifice bunts and and like stuff like that walks hit by pitches are also awarded points for because it is for team performance so okay the I gist got you. of it <laughs> i got you I, and now, now that i understand it a little bit better i actually kind of like this and i know you 
But I did a little bit more research. You ended up finishing 18th on the leaderboard, I believe, with uh, mm-hmm. 1,336 points. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good finishing position to me. I mean, I, I'm I honestly, I don't know enough about it to really uh, critique a finishing position, but it sounds like you ended up finishing the year pretty well. Yeah, I so I played in AUX and AU the two different seasons, and I actually like broke my wrist week mm-hmm. one of the first season, and so I wasn't fully healthy until week three of the final season. So I didn't get to play until week three, week four, and week five, and so um, I felt like I was able to play a little bit of uh, catch up the last three weeks and be able to move from like the low fifties because I wasn't able to compete to um, the teens. So I, I was happy with my performance. I was, um, excited with how I handled myself and how I handled my business. And obviously it always liked to be finished, finished higher, but, um, realistically, I think I did a pretty, a pretty decent, a decent job with the cards I was dealt with. So. Got you. Got you. I, and I, I had no idea about you getting hurt. I mean, I'm, it sounds like you, uh, recovered pretty quickly by it. Yeah, I did my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is something I've held off from asking because I thought it fit better here. And now uh, your jersey number changed. Well, whenever you got into Athletes Unlimited, and I know there's a, a well, I think it's pretty cool. There's kind of a special meaning to number 41 that what I've read about. I know you had some family ties to the number 41. Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, so I wore 41. It was my dad's basketball jersey. And I. it's funny because this is like a core memory. I distinctly remember when I was signing up for my first year of eight and under in rec leagues, I had the opportunity to um, choose my number. And so I run over to my dad and he's holding my sister who was just born and he's holding my sister. And I'm like, dad, what number should I be? And I think the previous year for T-ball, I was number nine. So I had no, like, I had no idea what I wanted to wear. And he goes, you should be number 41. And I was like, okay. So I go over to my coach and I say, I'd like to be number 41. So he writes me down and it's kind of just built from there. And so I have two younger sisters and they've been 41 their whole lives. Um, And so he has all of our jerseys that we've given him framed and in his office. And so they all say like Gibson 41 underneath. And so it's been a pretty cool thing to be able to represent him and feel like I have a tie to my family while I'm playing. And so I'm a pretty sentimental person. And so that definitely has given me comfort over the years of feeling like I have my dad and just my family with me. Um, and then I had to, there was 41 already taken in AU. And so mm-hmm. I had to go to, I had to pick five. And so I felt like four plus one was a good, a good <laughs> little um, like thing I could do with it. But I mean, I'm I think to make it in somehow. Yeah, I'm once 41 is open, I'm uh don't care what size or what I have to do for it, I will be wearing 41. So absolutely. Hey, I love it. I'm a pretty sentimental person as well. So uh moving on, let's I saw where you're at. The the does every player play for an organization under this, I believe. So are you playing for the uh I hope I this looks like the Cajun way of saying go, uh go mm-hmm. to go mm-hmm. to ovarian cancer awareness foundation. I'm this is I'm trying to connect this somehow. Does this have any connection to Alex Wilcox? It does. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. who played at Mississippi State. Okay. So uh, can you kind of touch on what that organization is? I mean, I know it goes toward ovarian cancer research, but I mean, how exactly did you come to, to uh, decide to play play for this organization? Well, I had two things that I wanted to either represent, and that was um, ovarian cancer or kidney kidney cancer. My my grandpa passed away of kidney failure lots of other things, but kidney failure. And so I wanted to represent either of the two. And I've just had a couple close people in my life um, have ovarian issues. And so I wanted Mm -hmm. to bring awareness to young women like Alex Wilcox, who may not necessarily feel like it is the time in their life that they'll be diagnosed with cancer. I mean, no one at the age of 19 or 18 or however old she was Mm -hmm. should ever be diagnosed with cancer, but being able to be aware of those symptoms and, and what comes with that is huge. And so just the education part, I had a uh, conversation with Beth, coach Beth Tarina at LSU, who's one of the founders. And she told me that the money doesn't just go to research. It goes to the women who have already been diagnosed with ovarian cancer to be able to trans like transport themselves to 
any type of hospital that they need for care. And so I was, there was one, I think she sent me that they had like a four hour drive or whatever. And so that this money that I've been helped being raised or the right, the money that I've been raising through Athletes Limited is going to help women and families be able to get the treatment that they need um, a little bit easier and, and more affordable for them. So, and I want to, I want young women to know that the symptoms and everything is, is very similar to other things that we have going on as women. And so it's just being in tune with your body and just trying to get the message out there that this can happen to anyone, but being able to be proactive about it is what we want to do. I love it. I love it. And now we're getting into the final topic to cover now. I mean, now that you've jumped back in the, back into the SEC as a volunteer assistant coach for Tony Baldwin's staff here in Athens, like what drew you to Athens? I know you touched on how you loved playing here as well, but as new coaches always have goals. I mean, do you have any set goals for your coaching debut for, say, when it comes to the spring? I don't have necessarily any goals. I just want to be able to be there for the girls individually. I think that I've had mm -hmm. a great opportunity to be able to build amazing relationships with my coaches um, in my past, and I want to be able to be an individual who they trust and who they go to when things are good and when things are bad. And so I, I want to be able to just help them with, a, with anything that they need. We have, we already have a staff that knows a ton and I'm, I'm learning a ton from them and being able to learn from a deep, top defensive coach like JT and, and be able to learn from the, the journey that Chelsea's had and, right. and the mm -hmm. hitting, the hitting part that Tony brings to the table it's um it's something that I feel very fortunate to be able to still be playing and still be guided by them but also bringing a little bit more of a of a connection piece for the girls and so I feel like that's really my role this year is how can I connect with them how can I be someone that can be in their corner and so I don't have any specific goals really it's just I've always felt really connected to Athens like I said earlier is it's a great place to be and they have a great uh, program, obviously, but I, I just have always enjoyed the way that they play and the way that they hold their their heads high. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, now your impressions of the fall season, I know y'all went through and I think five games, I believe this, this fall five and oh, and outscored opponents. I mean, at, the offense was absolutely ridiculous and 85 to nine overall score last game, of course, was red and black. So y'all played each other. Just overall, kind of give your impressions as we try to close this down of how the of how the girls looked on both ends. Gosh, you've got some great athletes. That's my that's my impression is these kids can play. These kids can play ball and they are way advanced for their their years and they're just becoming more mature as they go. And I'm excited to just watch them compete. And we talk about it a lot is, you know, there's a lot of things that coaches do probably for the betterment of them, but We'd obviously love to take credit for a lot of their adjustments, but at the end of the day, they're they're the ones doing it. They're the ones competing. They're the ones finding joy in each in each day. And so I can just give all the all the credit to them and and how hard they've worked and how coachable they've been and how willing they've been to be courageous and to show their stuff on the field. So Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely excited to see the dogs come this spring. I know they fell short of a big goal last year. And I mean, just from what, uh, like watching some videos on social media and seeing the scores and all, I think, uh, especially with some of the transfers as well, I think they're in for a big year. So final question, I asked the same thing of Carson uh, whenever I interviewed her. Can you describe Daniel Gibson in one word, whether it be as a person, a player, a coach, just kind of describe yourself? Uh, confident. Conf nice. I like it. I like it. Confident. Definitely confident. Confident in my ability to be a sister, to be a daughter, to be a wife, to be a coach, to be a player. Uh, confidence is uh, is how I hold my hold my head. I like it. I like it. And as as we begin to sign off, I want to get thank the thank the sponsors one more time. Law Office of Joseph I. Marchant, Riles Drugstore, the Merchants and Citizens Bank, Milton CPA Services. Stamps Walker Insurance Agency, Vineyard Doodles, and the Cannon Law Firm. Once again, thank you so much, Danielle. This has been a blast, and I will wish you and the Lady Dogs all the best, and hopefully I can sit down uh, sometime soon in the near future to talk, to talk more. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and go dogs. Go dogs.